Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Be a Fence Around Me by Fred Hammond. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for protecting and preserving us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for protecting and preserving this country. We thank you, Lord, for protecting and preserving our churches and our families. Lord, continue to be our, our, our banner, our protector. Continue to be one that brings us back from a bad and from a low place. Continue to be with us, Lord, even as we navigate these very difficult times. And Lord, for those that are doing well, for those that have made it through this situation relatively unscathed, I thank God for them. And I thank God that you've worked in their lives in that way. And I pray that they may be the conduits to help those who are not as fortunate as they have been. We pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, God bless you. Good, uh, good to see you. Good Sunday. Happy Sunday. Hopefully your Thanksgiving uh, went well. Uh, the scripture for today is Psalms 42. That's uh, Psalms 42. Now I have a new Bible today. It's, the, uh, it's actually my study Bible. It's not the King James Version. It's called the Christian Standard Bible. Um, so I'm going to be going back and forth between the King James Version, the authorized King James Version that I normally use, as well as the uh, Christian Standard Bible Version, which is simpler, more modern English. Uh, this is Psalms 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. 
how all day long people say to me, where is your God? I remember this as I pour out my heart. I walk with many leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. I am deeply de depressed, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from the mounds of Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your billows have swept over me. The Lord will send his faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? My adversaries taunt me as if crushing my bones. While all day long they say to me, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God. Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Amen. That's Psalms 42. Um, in terms of announcements, um, definitely next week uh, we will have an upgraded service. We had some technology issues. We were able to overcome those technology issues. Then we have to do some editing issues this coming week. Uh, but next week, which is the first week of December, uh, we're going to have an upgraded service. So I'm looking forward to that. And also we'll give you an update in terms of our status with the state of New York. Hopefully we'll have some uh, great news by then. Um, today is the first of our two-part series on Noah's Ark. Today's Noah's Ark part one. Next Sunday will be Noah's Ark part two. Um, the, uh, <laughs> now in terms of pastor's word, I have both a pastor's word as well as a preview of the service. You know, Ark is a story that everybody knows about, but, the, but the, I think in order to really get into the context of what was going on, we're gonna have to have some discussion about some of the context in which uh, those events happened. So um, I think this is what the ninth message had really been fairly, um, uh, fairly, you know, pretty middle of the road in terms of theology and analysis and things like that. Uh, but today is going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk about really something called winners and losers. Winners and losers. Now, um, there is something called, and I hate to bring it up, I hate talking about these these types of subjects or this, or this subject. Uh, there is something called heaven and there is something called hell. There is something called heaven, there is something called hell. And many, many people will go to heaven and many, many people will not go to heaven. Uh, for hell, for purposes of our discussion, is really something called the lake of fire. So again, this is not, not necessarily something that, that you know we talk about a lot, but the Holy Spirit has kind of moved me in this direction. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, if you look at Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it says at the end, those whose names are found in the Lamb's book of life will go to heaven. Then it describes the new earth, describes something that looks like a new Garden of Eden, describes a new Jerusalem. Not much about the new heaven, uh, but, Paul, but Paul does say that the things that God has prepared for those who love him, those that go to heaven, it's beyond comprehension. It's like you can't even imagine what it's like, how great things are going to be in heaven so he gave us a glimpse of the new earth gave us a glimpse of the new jerusalem gave us a glimpse of the new garden of eden doesn't really talk about heaven but for those whose names are written and this is how it's described for those whose names are written in the lamb's book of life the lamb being jesus they will go to heaven and be with god forever then it says that those whose names are not found in the lamb's book of life will be these are the words used throne that's the, that's the word. He's thrown into the lake of fire where he will be or he or she will be with and names a few people. It says with the Antichrist, with the false prophet, with the devil and all of his angels. The Antichrist, the false prophet will have already been there and everybody else, including those humans that are not in heaven and of course the devil's angels all will be thrown into the lake of fire well they will be forever and ever and ever 
Now, this is all based on this one truth. The truth is that human beings are not animals. Human beings can make choices. We have, as you heard in, in Adam and Eve 3, free will. I know grace and free will is a very complicated subject. We'll talk about that later. I know a lot of people, there's a lot of messages about grace out there. And, and you know, it, it focuses on grace, not really the free will part. I think to a certain extent, it's, 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 uh, th those messages are, are often incomplete those messages of grace because they talk about the grace part but they don't talk about the free will part and it's both so if you if you think about the issue of free will and again all humans have some level of free will in their lives there are basically winners and losers if you choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior there are things that happen for you and to you. If you choose not to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there are things that happen to you and for you. Again, we're not animals. Again, if, if an animal, if a lion goes after a zebra, a pack of, uh, let's say, female lions, they attack the zebra, they eat the zebra, that's not a sin. As they're eating the zebra, if a pack of a larger pack of hyenas come and they steal a zebra, which is something that's their, in, that's their instinct, hyenas steal from lions. You know, lions eat zebras, hyenas steal from them. So if the hyena steals it from the lions, they're not sitting. And if the male lions, there's usually two or three male lions that are hanging out protecting the tribe, the pride, if they go out and they kill a hyena, right, and take it back, which is what their instinct is, that's also not a sin. Animals don't sin, they act according to their nature. Human beings, we don't have a particular nature. We could do this. And we could do that. So, sorry for bringing that up. But free will, free will has consequences. Free will has consequences, both good as well as bad. Free will has consequences, both for good, for the individual, for a society, for a family, for a community, and bad for an individual, for a family, for a society, for a community. Now, what is the preview of the service? This is uh, Noah's Ark Part 1. Subtitle is Faith. Noah's Ark Part 1. Subtitle is Faith. Um, and next week will be Part 2, which will be Works. Um, now, the, the thing about Noah, Noah and his relationship with God, uh, his his theology and his religion worked in harmony together. His theology and his religion worked in harmony together. That's where we should be. What's the uh, theology? Is what does God say? Theology is studying God. Who is God? What is God? What does God say? Right? What is God about? What's God's nature? What are God's instructions for us? And religion is how we apply that. So, for example. You know, if, if you read the Bible and you believe after reading the Bible, you have an obligation to feed the poor, you have an obligation to feed the poor. What do you do? You get together a board, you write up some bylaws, you apply for nonprofit status in whatever, whatever state you're in. Once that's approved, you solicit donations, solicit volunteers, solicit people to donate food to you. You get a place, you put it all together, and then you give out the food into the community. That's your religion. That's, you know, you call that a church. You call that a nonprofit. So based on your, your theology, based on what you believe God has spoken to you and to your heart, based on his nature, his words, his commands, you put boots to the ground and you create an organization to fulfill what you believe God's word or God's uh, command to you is. So your theology, which is your view of God, is in harmony with your religion, your nonprofit, your church, your organization. They work in harmony together so that the words of God, the commands of God, actually get implemented on the earth. 
Noah's theology worked in harmony with his religion to fulfill God's command to him and his family. So let's look at Genesis 6, verses 9 to 22, the story of Noah's Ark. Genesis 6, verses 9 to 22. And again, this is from the Christian Standard Bible. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Genesis 6, verses 9 and 22. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God, and Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. Then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I am going to destroy, the, destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher, gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and outside. This is how you are to make it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. You are to make a roof finishing the size of the ark to within 18 inches of the roof. You are to put a door on the side of the ark, make it with lower, middle, and upper decks. Understand that I am bringing a flood, flood waters on the earth to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife, and your son's wives. You are also to bring into the ark two of two of all the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of everything, from the birds according to their kinds, from the, livestock, from the livestock according to their kinds, and from the animals that crawl on the ground according to their kind. They will come to you so that you can keep them, they will come to you so that you will keep them alive. Take with you every kind of food that is eaten, gather it as food for you and for them. And Noah did this, he did everything that God had commanded him. You may be seated. Lord, speak through your servant today and bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what was going on around that time? Well, we talked about Adam and Eve. We talked about the fact that they sinned. And after they sinned, really when Adam sinned, uh, turned over the authority of the earth to the devil. So there were some people on the earth that were not doing the right thing. You know, Cain killed Abel. And there's a whole lot of stories about people doing things that are not really in keeping with God's commandment. There were some people who were doing the right thing uh, because there was some reference to Seth, the other son of Adam and Eve. Uh, after they had Cain, they had Abel, they had Seth. And, and from Seth's line, there were people who were calling on the name of the Lord. So not everything was totally at loss. But for the most part, I would say the descendants of, of Cain, that line of humanity, they just started to sink further and further into depravity. And, and the earth was described as, as a place that was full of violence. Full of violence. I mean, if you notice, you know, after the flood, you know, people built cities and things like that. And they, they, you know, they had this city, which is named this, this city named that. If you notice, between Genesis and the flood, there were no cities mentioned. No cities. People were probably just robbing and stealing from each other and doing all sorts of acts of violence against each other to the point where nobody could actually accumulate anything and do anything. There was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of depravity improper sexual relations and and violence human to human violence people killing each other robbing each other to the point where humanity really couldn't even do anything constructive so god decided to put an end to it and he but he gave noah noah found favor with god noah was somebody who was going to do the right thing Noah was somebody who, if God spoke to that person, spoke to him, he knew that Noah would do the right thing and organize his life in such a way that he would fulfill God's commandment. 
And that's exactly what happened. Now, the, the, the thing about this story, the thing about this story is, I mean, in many respects, this is the, the biggest act of faith in all of the Bible. I mean, there are a lot of things that, that were acts of faith, um, in fact, those things are talked about more. So, for example, the, the, the parting of the Red Sea, where an entire nation was taken from Egypt, taken from slavery, sent out away from their slave masters toward the land that God would give them. But in order to do that, they had to get past this barrier. And this story of, of God intervening and separating the, the Red Sea, allowing them to cross on dry land, yet destroying the armies of Pharaoh that tried to chase after them is a story that's repeated over and over again, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's a story that's constantly repeated, this huge story of faith. But it was preceded by a few things. So, for example, when, Noah, excuse me, when Moses went to Egypt to bring his people out, Pharaoh said no several times. And God kept using Moses time after time to show Pharaoh by miracle the power of God. So, so, so Moses did a number of miracles from the snake, you know, from uh, the frogs and the flies and the gnats. So there, was a, there were a series of miracles leading up to the Red Sea. So even though the Red Sea, of course, was this huge miracle, both the people of God, his people Israel, Moses, Pharaoh, as well as the Egyptians, they saw the power of God leading up to that point. So even though this was a tremendous thing, God had shown himself, shown his power through Moses, right, up to that point. But the other thing is Abraham. The other big story that, that's constantly talked about in the Old Testament, constantly talked about in the New Testament, is the story of Abraham being brought from his land, his home. Ur of the Chaldees, right, with his family, starts, stops in Haran, H-A-R-A-N. Some, his relatives die, and then he gets the call from God in Haran to go to Canaan, go to the land that I'm bringing you. The story that's always talked about, and it's a miracle that he would leave everything that he knew and take his family to a land that he had never been. And from him, from Abraham, comes an entire nation of people. A tremendous act. Abraham is called the father of faith. But again, as big as that was, and as much as it's talked about, in both in the Old and the New Testament, it's, it's you know, it's, it's regional. It affects a particular region of the world. Stuff that was going on here or in Africa or in certain parts of Europe, wasn't, they weren't directly affected by that. So it was a miracle, huge miracle. And the last one, of course, is the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of Jesus. It's, it's obviously, it was, it was foretold in the Old Testament, in Isaiah and different places, foretold. There's, there's hundreds of clues in the Old Testament that the Messiah would come, the Messiah would be crucified, the Messiah would, raise from, would be raised from the dead. And of course, Jesus, when he was on the earth, constantly reminded his disciples that he came to die and he would be resurrected from the dead and that from that point he would have power and he would give that power to them. So this is something that was talked about from the beginning. The fact that Messiah would come, Messiah would live, Messiah would die, Messiah would be raised from the dead. But again, Elijah had raised people from the dead. And that's in the Old Testament. Elisha had raised someone from the dead. That's in the Old Testament. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead while he was alive during his ministry. Now, obviously, somebody raising themselves from the dead is a huge miracle. And it's, it had worldwide impact because it affected all of humanity. We were now reconciled, had an opportunity to be reconciled with God. And now we had an opportunity to take back the authority that the devil had over the earth. So it was a huge miracle. And I obviously talked about all over. But this thing that happened with Noah had no precedent. It had never rained on earth. There had never been a flood. 
There had never been an object, an art, you know, something that big for that purpose. No prior precedent, no prior raising from the dead, no prior miracles leading up to that. And it was not just regional. It affected everybody because the only people that eventually went on that boat, there were only eight people on that boat. That's Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Eight people were on that boat. The rest of humanity perished. This is one of the biggest miracles in, in the whole Bible. If not, I would, I would argue the biggest miracle because there was no precedent for it ahead of time. And Noah acted with faith. Noah believed what the Lord said and decided to do something about it. So our working definition of faith for purposes of this message is faith is when you act like something's going to happen. Faith is when you act like the thing that God told you is actually going to happen. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean by acting like it's going to happen? So just some common, ordinary examples. If, you know, I, I guess some people still do send letters, right? Most people send emails or pay stuff online. But if you had to pay a bill, you had to pay you know, your Home Depot bill or some other bill. You, you take out your checkbook, you write the check. You put it in an envelope. You seal the envelope. You put a stamp on it, and then you walk it down either to your post office or put it in your mailbox, right? Obviously, you, you're not going to walk it through the mail system until it gets to the Home Depot processing office. You're going to have just faith that you've done your part, and you're acting as if when you send your check for $100, that through the mail system, that's going to get there. It's going to get to Home Depot. They will process it. They will deposit it. And your bank will honor the transaction. That's an act of faith. You don't actually know if it's going to get there. But based on your faith in the post office, Home Depot's accounting system, and the banking system, you act as if this thing that I'm doing is going to result in my bill being paid. Act like it's going to happen. Because they told you, Home Depot told you, that if you send your check to this address, we will credit your account for the amount that you gave us. Another thing is, you know, sitting in your chair. I mean, you, everybody has a chair. There it is. You, you, you want to sit in it. You go there. You sit down. And you, you believe that it's going to hold you up, that it's not going to break, that you're not going to fall over, that it's going to be strong enough to bear your weight. Why? Because you bought the chair. There's a certain manufacturer's warranty. It's supposed to do certain things. It's always done that thing every time you've used it, every time somebody else has used it. So you, you act as if when you go to sit down, the chair will bear up your weight for as long as you sit on it. That's an act of faith. I'm, you don't know if the chair is going to hold up before you do it, but you believe that if you go and sit in it, it will hold up your weight. And finally, turning on your car. I mean, you get into a car, people have some people have cars, some people don't. If if the car is inspected, properly inspected, and the car is tuned up, you've already done that, and the car has gas and it has oil, and the car is insurance. In other words, once you do your part, you make sure that the car is inspected, you make sure that the car is tuned up. You make sure that the car has gas so that when you turn it on in your driveway, on your garage, or in the street, you believe that the car will start. Now, you don't know if the car is actually going to start, but you do what's necessary. You act as if. You prepare yourself, prepare the situation, prepare the car, 
and you act as if it will start when I turn on the engine. Now, it's faith. Faith is very, very simple. What does that mean for us? It starts with, well, what does God say about a matter? What does God say about a matter? How do you know what God says about something? How do you know what God's instructions are about anything? Well, we have something here more than Noah ever had. Noah didn't have this. Noah just had the stories about what happened with, with Adam and Eve and the stories about what happened with Cain and Abel, stories about what happened with Seth. But he had a direct word. He heard, he heard, he sensed, he perceived, he believed that the Lord spoke to him about a particular matter about a particular situation. And then he acted as if it were going to rain. He had nothing previously to rely on to say that it would rain. But he, he heard the word of God. He understood what God said about a matter. And then he acted as if this matter was true. So now we have God's word. We have the Bible. We know what God says about certain things. We know God, what God's instructions are for our life when it comes to love, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to forgiving other people, when it comes to purpose, when it comes to money, when it comes to health, when it comes to the church, and when it comes to, most importantly, how to treat each other, both in the church and outside of the church both in your family and outside of your family. So understanding what the commands, what the directives of the Lord are for us is a lot simpler than the, the, than the directives God gave to Abraham, that God gave to Noah, that God gave to Moses. Because at that time, none of the Bible had actually been written yet. Now we have the benefit of God's word. Now, obviously there's, there's other ways to hear from God. There's prophecy, and then there's meditation. During your prayer life, you can get a certain sense of what the God is saying about a particular situation. And of course, that prophecy or that thing that directive that you get while meditating has to be consistent with God's word. So for example, if you believe that the Lord is telling you something in meditation and the word is, I want you to go shoot the police chief of your city. No, that is not consistent with God's word. Or I want you to go approach somebody who's already married, who's already married, and, and, and try to get them to be your spouse. Again, that's not consistent with God's word. Right? We're not supposed to murder people. We're not supposed to pursue people who are already married. So whatever you know, prophetic word you get, or whatever word you get in your own personal meditation, again, has to be consistent with God's word or else it's not something that we should follow. So the simpler way to do it is to, is to meditate on God's word, have an understanding of God's word, right? Start there, you know, the prophecy and all that meditation, you know, that'll come a little bit later, but start with God's, start with what we know to be true. And then you get that directive and then you act as if it's gonna happen. Noah had never seen rain before. He had never seen rain before, but God had told him that it was going to rain. Not only that, if you do this thing that I tell you, not only will your family be saved, but the, the wildlife and the animals of the earth will also be saved. And it says that Noah did everything that God had commanded. So the, the lesson to us 
in the body of Christ in America is listen to God's word. Understand his directives. Align yourself with the body of believers, with the church, or create your own nonprofit. And then do the things either through that church or through your nonprofit, legally, of course, by the book, to implement the things that God has shown you, to implement the things that God has directed you. Listen for God's word. Understand his directives for a particular situation. Build the system that you need to implement God's word regarding that subject. And then wait for it to rain. That's it. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your directive. In Jesus' name, amen. So now, the altar's open. If Jesus Christ is not Lord of your life, the altar's open. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So how do we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him, raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you're not saved, if Jesus Christ is not Lord of your life, just repeat after me. Lord, I thank you. I confess my sins. I need you as Lord and Savior of my life. I believe that you love me. I believe that you came and you lived an example for me. I believe that you died for us and for me. And I believe that after the third day that you rose from the dead. Therefore, I am saved. So, and for those that have already saved, who are already saved, who have already confessed Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, we also offer baptism. Now, if you look at our website, it talks about our philosophy of baptism. Right now, we're a virtual church. We're working on getting a situation where we can have people baptized between now and the time we open up in September 2021. So if you want to be baptized, send us an email on our contact list on the email on our website. And we will make arrangements at some point between now and next September to have you baptized. And again, if you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist, his cousin, was baptized with the Holy Spirit. The apostles in, in Acts chapter 2, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it, it empowered them to do ministry on the earth, to do God's will, the, God's command on the earth. So right now, if you want to um, accept and be received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. Just repeat after me. Just start praising the Lord. Just start worshiping the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. And now, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Speak in tongues right now in Jesus' name. So we always like to do this at the end. You know, what does God do? What do we do? What does God do? What do we do? What does God do? What do we do? Well, what God does is he gives us commands. He gives us directives. He gives us wisdom. He gives us opportunities, all in, all in his word. He gives us love and shows us how to love. He gives us compassion and shows us how to have compassion. So these things, the, the same words that Noah heard from God, we could hear from God through his word. And what do we do? Well, uh, to the extent that what we get from that is consistent with God's word, we build the systems that we need to implement the things that God has told us to do, whether that's in the church that we're already in or in a separate organization. But it's not a matter of just hearing, hearing, and hearing, and hearing. 
Faith means you act as if the thing that you heard is true and build your life around that word, that command, that opportunity. And then when the time is right, wait for it to rain. Now, my name is Marlon Curtin. This is the Rockaway Cathedral. We're building God's kingdom in you. Go in victory, go in peace in Jesus' name. Amen.